facility earlier, then they end up at the emergency room because they say, well, they're going to have to take us. So how much is your emergency room rate up? Your, uh, uh, how many of them? They're probably at about 15%, 10 to 15%, but the big thing is the acuity is yeah. so much worse. It's not, the numbers aren't up as much as you might expect, but when they're finally coming in, they're so sick that they require a transfer because we don't have acute right? we just have acute care means our people. So they they require a transfer to Jackson or Memphis to get that care. And so that's where we're really seeing it. Our indigent numbers, our write off, our deductibles are up about ten percent. We're the percentage of deductions yeah, is right. about uh, seventy eight to eighty percent. Month. In a small rural hospital, we can't last like that. Your uncompensated is 78% a month? Wow. So team care didn't expand. Right. And yeah. so none of that money disappeared for the emergency rooms. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there, all the little hospitals are. <coughs> See, we used to get the Medicare um, subsidy for a Medicare dependent hospital, and we don't get that anymore. And Medicaid was supposed to pick up the slack. Right. There's no Medicaid to pick up the slack, so we're just kind of following. Yeah. It's, um, the totally. insurance is more expensive than <coughs> the care less accessible, and that's what government uh, restriction does. This is why mm -hmm. our goal would be to get the cost of insurance down and allow people to access care. It's also one of the reasons I work so tirelessly on that, allowing veterans to get care in their local communities and the VA pay for that, rather than somebody having to find transportation to Memphis or to Murfreesboro or to Nashville or somewhere to get that care. You know, it's much easier to do it. The other thing that we're seeing also is um, Medicare Advantage plans, they are not in, in a hurry to approve an admission, so they sit in the hospitals for days that the hospitals are not being paid for, they're providing the care, the medications, and they're just sitting on their laurels, you know, no hurry to get United, them out of acute care. Yeah. United Healthcare is 14 days, 14 days, yeah. yeah. and, and not admitted sooner. From a mental health perspective, uh, Medicare limits us so much with who can provide the service mm -hmm. on certain ones, LCSW psychologists, or practitioners and or doctors and psychiatrists. But uh, in rural Western State, it's hard to find some of those licensed folks. And uh, that makes it, <clears throat> and we have more to manage care companies look for opportunity to, to transfer those that might be your own care care um, opportunities to move to Medicare, which when you do that, hurts us. We it keeps on growing. Where not too many years ago we might have had 100 Medicare. Now we're up uh, in the neighborhood of a thousand. Wow. And that makes it more difficult. We just grow with the same all thing. The time. We don't see any relief in the near future. Right. So you have more people and less reimbursement. Right. The same thing with home health. Every day we do this, the managed cares come out. They go in and give this person who has no idea what they're signing up for. No idea. They just go house to house to house, give them a free can, you know, whatever. And they don't realize that they're giving up what they are giving up. Maybe their doctor doesn't take this, their hospital doesn't take this. We take most all of the advantage plans, and when we get the referral, and when I call, this is every day, three or four times a day, we get the referral, we call, and they say, we have up to 14 days to decide. Well, if the patient coming home from the hospital needs wound care, they don't have 14 days. So, I mean, there we are once again, you know, I mean, it, it makes you sick. You've got people who truly need it, who have given up everything they've worked for forever. <coughs> and then, you know, we're told we, we do 14 days, and then sometimes they'll give it and sometimes they won't. Right. And when they do give it, they'll give them seven days, mm -hmm. and then that's it, you mm -hmm. know. And, and then oftentimes they, get, they just get sick or go back to the hospital, and mm -hmm. they get the for yeah, remission. Period. I don't want to take anything out of context. In some of our conversations, haven't you stated that, that there's been an instance where they may have thought that they had coverage, but in their advantage plan, there wasn't even a nursing home. Exactly. 
Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where previously they did, but they'd sign up with an right. advantage plan and there was nothing there for long-term care. Right. I would love to see the advantage plans not be able to go house to house to call on the phone and sign these people up. I mean, truly, unless there's somebody there who actually, where they present the whole plan and say, okay, who's your doctor? Let's call and see if they're going to take this insurance. Who's your hospital? I mean, you know, if they're a dialysis patient, anything. I mean, yeah. it's, it's the whole, it's the whole bit. Sure, we have, so. we have, um, we don't have patients right now. There are people that are <coughs> that are signed with advantage plans and that do not have a provider locally. They're having to go like to Dyersburg, right. you know, mm -hmm. Union City, things like that. Crazy because things. <laughs> it really, it's bizarre. Well, we not talked about them. elder abuse and, and, and all of these things. We want to compartmentalize that. But this is probably one of the largest frauds that has ever been perpetuated on the elderly in this country. Mm -hmm. And if you work in this, you understand it. If you're outside this, you don't understand it. And, and it's, it's absolutely criminal. And I don't know why it isn't being treated that way. They go in, they take advantage of people who have dementia, who are living at home, who really should not be making these decisions, uh, family members who don't understand the repercussions of what they're doing, and, and then as nursing homes, it's just a nightmare for them. We call to try to pre-cert these, and, and they'll have a $6,500 deductible that they'll have to meet, and well, what resident in a nursing home has $6,500? Well, that's like the email from the lady mm -hmm. on the insurance. She said, I don't have $6,000 to handle this. So, um, you know, and of course, not taking the money. And I voted against all this, but they voted to take the money out of Medicare and go after those advantage plans and move it to Obamacare. To stand up that program because they had to make their numbers work. So this is all one of the reasons for repealing this and getting it off the books. That's going to be the way to fix it, to get to the root of the problem, is to fix it and to repeal it and get rid of it and then start over and put some things in place that are, that are necessary and good that deal with some of the parity issues uh, deal, deal with some of the issues that are happening. Yeah. You know, we, and we have, and I'm also the president of our SIS, THCA, so I'm involved in some of the more global issue, issues yeah. at the state level, but one of the things with choices, which I know you're mm -hmm. at the national level, but yeah. you used to be at the state level, but, um, you know, choices at some point is planning to passively enroll people that are on Medicaid into the Medicaid or Advantage programs, which is a big concern of, for us as providers is that they won't have a choice once they become a Medicaid recipient, that they will then automatically, without their knowledge, be moved into the whatever in managed care organization they're in into their Medicare Advantage program. So that's one issue that our association is, is working with. But, you know, I guess the other issue is there's supposedly a QIO <coughs> entity out there now that's just that CMS has separated out from our regular QIO for monitoring the managed care entities that we can report abuses to. So, to me, that says at the national level they've identified that this is an issue. And then I guess thirdly, just piggybacking on what everyone's saying, you know, I think, you know, we as healthcare providers, you know, we let our families know and our residents know that they have a right to unenroll. You know, there's only one type of a year that they can do it. Right. I know Obamacare, tiny back to Obamacare, that's a different story, but I think those of us, most of us are in more at the elder care level, but, but even then, we've got, I was just talking to someone at the convention last week, that the MCO that their resident unenrolled from came, actually had their lawyer send a letter to them, tell them not to do that. I mean, so, you know, they're just very aggressive at this point. 
that these people are truly being denied services that they earn because medical care, yeah. they earned it. Right. That's right. Well, they pay into it. Yes. Right. And I can get wrong with it. These things include the start. Okay, let me ask you this. Yeah. 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 yeah, and these people have no idea. Yeah. You know, we'll get it, we'll run their insurance, we'll get a referral. We think they're Medicare, they're not. They have no idea that they have. And then they start having co pays. And here, county by county, we serve this office services to counties, Harmon and Fayette. If they live in Fayette County, they have a higher co pay mm -hmm. because of the area. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. Yeah. I ran into someone who was a new enrollee into Medicare. <coughs> and they were so funny, they were so frustrated. They said, this Medicare insurance costs me more. The co-pays are higher. Can't you just let me keep what I've got us? And well, actually, we had had a bill that would allow people to stay if they're still working, which mo most people are. Stay with their private insurance until age 70. I had it in uh, the house probably six years ago. Senator Alexander carried it uh, in the Senate for me. And <coughs> that's what people want to see, have some choice that is there. We know getting to the root cause is getting this off the books so that they don't break the Medicare trust fund to stand up above. We know that. How do we patch it through? How's the best way to educate people so that they know what they're what they're getting? I mean, how do we address this at the local level? What do y'all think is the best way to go at this? Well, you know, the commercials are gonna start running probably next right. month. I think someone should run commercials to counteract that information mm -hmm. to let them know actually just what it actually entails. How's, how's the best way to do that, Don? Is it the senior centers or mm -hmm. uh, well, should I the mean, county or the city do an information session and bring some different people in like the hospital? And well, for instance, like, like that, every senior center will be bombarded with a marketer. I mean, they'll be there. Of course, you know, but people will, <coughs> you know, just, I, should the county and city do that? Maybe have an information system mm -hmm. and have some of the local again, you know, they just try to educate them. Know what you're you'll know what you're giving up. When you sign for the advantage plan, make sure make sure of what of what you're signing up for. And you've got a grassroots group here that would I'm sure they would be willing to well, work with you. No mayors here. Absolutely. Maybe just y'all huddle and see if someone our maybe. big problem our senior center center we we've tried in the past two years try to do everything I mean, actively in the last two years trying to boost our attendance, and we're doing a little better now, but basically you can say from 10 to 20 people that we're serving in the community. And it's sad, but we're trying to do everything we can to boost that. Uh, <clears throat> while I've got the floor, y'all are addressing one side of it. We have uh, 100 or less employees. We, we've got a real good uh, insurance program. We, we pay a gap. Sheila, you, get, you, you know the exact number, but basically it's costing the city about $8,000 a year to cover our employees. Is that correct, Sheila? $8,000. And, and our people do have good insurance coverage. By the same token, I'm retired military and, and I have Medicare and TRICARE. And I'm already, and, and they take good care of it, but I'm going to 71 years old, I go to doctors right now that don't want to see me or my wife because of the fact that Medicare and track care uh, doesn't pay enough. They don't want to see us. So, you know. Uh, it's the reimbursement rate. Right. Yeah, the reimbursement rate. Right, but, but the bottom line is, you know, the city of Oliver, it cost us almost $900,000 a year to take care of our employees. And that's an astronomical figure on the <coughs> budget that, that we have. But we do, we're, we're definitely, we're trying to take care of our employees, and our employees do it, they probably have as good a coverage as anybody in the United States. You know, the county side, uh, uh, a buddy here who's fixed to get really loaded with this, all I constantly hear is, how come our insurance is not good as, as the city's insurance? So you you get to deal with that, Mr. Thing. Look forward to it. But it has due to the gap. We take we're absorbing the uh, difference. You know the copay, the uh, yeah. 